So the topic I'm going to talk about today is uh, multiplier ideals. So, um, let's see. So, so for this lecture, I'm going to follow. Uh, so the second volume of uh, Lazarsfeld's book on positivity has kind of a. And the, 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 the two volume set is roughly divided into three sections, and uh, the third section has things about Q divided with multiplier ideals. And the, uh, the idea is that the multiplier ideal, you have, uh, um, you have some J of XD, is so let's say that X is a smooth. Although, in fact, you know, you can, you can alter these a bit, but, uh, you know, just, I'll just stick with this presentation for now. So let's say X is smooth and like B is a divisor. Let's say an effective Q divisor. Then this is, uh, you know, going to be some subsheet of O of X. This will be the multiplier ideal associated to x and z, the sheaf of ideals, uh, which reflects the singularities of the pair x and d. So, so the multiplier ideal x d reflects the singularities. So, uh, in particular, the, uh, the 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 nice property this has is that uh, um, is that the you take the vanishing of this multiplier ideal. So you just look at the you know the you know if you take the, the quotient of of this inclusion of sheaves, then you get the structure sheaf of some subscheme, and that subscheme. You know, as a set, at least, this is going to be the locus of, you know, so, you know, often this is called log canonical centers or whatever, but uh, I prefer the, the terminology non Kalamata log terminal. So, singularities. Just for the reason that uh, if, the, if the pair is a, uh, you know, you know, if you, if you just barely have a multiplier, like a non-trivial multiplier ideal, then you're log canonical. But like once you go further, then you're uh, um, well, then then your singularities are worse than log canonical. So it doesn't really make sense to say these are the log canon. This is the locus of log canonical singularities because it's like you know log canonical is like better than a thing, whereas this is worse than a thing. So that's why we use non-KLT singularities. Okay, so what is the definition? Uh, so I'm gonna give you the definition and then I'll do some examples. I think the examples are kind of what really make this work. Um, so the idea is that, you know, given, so we're given our X and our D, and what we do is we take uh, X prime X, a log resolution, of uh, of x with this divisor d, and then we define j of x d is going to be pi uh, mu lower star of the relative canonical class minus uh, the roundup of the pullback. Okay, so I mean this may not look super enlightening, but the idea is that if there's no D whatsoever, then this guy, you know, isn't there, and then we're just taking the, the push forward of kx prime over x, and then you know you have various relative vanishing theorems that just say, well, you know, there's no higher cohomology, and in fact this is just, you know, 
going to just give you the structure sheets back. Um, and, you know, I mean, you could also, you think, you know, that vanishing theorem it also works in kind of the KLT setting. So the idea is that, you know, uh, if you think of, you know, if, if, you're, if you're kind of thinking of, you know, this KX prime is, you know, the canonical divisor upstairs and the KX is the canonical divisor downstairs, then this subtracting, uh, you know, mu upper star of D is really just saying, okay, instead of using the canonical divisor downstairs, we're using the log canonical divisor upstairs, and then we're allowing, you know, maybe, you know, this roundabout maybe comes from, we're allowing a boundary on, uh, you know, so, so in other words, like the idea is that this roundup, um, maybe I want the round down, now I'm a little confused, but um, well, we, when we do an example, this will, this will uh, make sense. But the idea is that uh, essentially, you can kind of tweak things so that as long as, you know, your singularities are better than log canonical, nothing is showing up. But as soon as you hit like something log canonical, then um, you're gonna get some non-trivial, uh, thing here. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let's, let's do some examples and then maybe I'll say a little more about the motivation. Um, kind of, you know, the standard examples are just thinking about uh, P2 or surfaces. So suppose I have, you know, a normal crossing divisor uh, with coefficients alpha and beta here, and you know, an a2 or p2 or whatever. Uh, and so this is my d. And then I want to compute what the uh, yeah. So what I want to do is I want to compute what the uh, um, multiplier ideal is. So for our x prime, we just take the blow up at the point P of our surface, and our surface is P2, and then to calculate Kx prime over x, well, that's just, um, maybe the round up goes somewhere else. Uh, or maybe this is supposed to be the round down. Well, doing the example will get us the right definition. Okay, so we have the, the blow up at P of P2, and you know, let's, let's actually just uh, alter the name. It'll make it a little more interesting for the third line in multiples can get out. So let's do three lines. And then the point is that Kx prime over x is equal to just the exceptional divisor of the blow. So this is just the standard adjunction formula for surfaces um, that you know you blow up once, and you know this e, you know which is not ample over the base, but it's actually you know the negative of an ample divisor over the base. And then the idea is that well you know you push it forward and you don't, and it just kind of you know everything kind of goes away. Okay, and then. You know, if I take mu upper star of d, well, what does that look like? Well, the picture I get is I get, you know, I get my surface, I have a minus one curve here, which is my e, and then I have my three lines, the strict transfer the forms of them, alpha, beta, and gamma, and then the multiplicity along e is I have just have alpha plus beta plus gamma. Okay, and then yeah. So I guess it is subtracting the round down. Um, yeah, I guess you have to be a little bit careful with this because uh, yeah. So then. You know, the idea here is that, well, if the, uh, you know, so let's say the alpha, beta, and gamma are less than, less than one for the moment. Um, so if alpha, beta, gamma are less than one, then, you know, subtracting the round down of each of these, 
Well, the round down of each, each of these has, has multiples to be zero along uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, you know, individually. So you can kind of ignore those. And then the idea is that, um, you know, this E, when I push it forward, I get, you know, no ideals. And if I lower this E down to an O, if I just have divisor zero here, when I push it forward, I still don't get anything. But once I get down to minus E, then that minus E, that divisor upstairs is representing functions that vanish at the, at the blown up point downstairs. So if alpha, beta, and gamma are less than one, and alpha plus beta plus gamma is less than two, well then what we have is this, this uh, round down of uh, mu upper star of d is just going to be uh, less than or equal to e, and so when I and so then my multiplier ideal is just trivial. On the other hand, once this is greater than or equal to to two, then this uh, this no longer obtains, and then I bump this up to two e. So if so this, you know, is my main assumption, and then I have this assumption, or I could assume if alpha plus beta plus gamma is greater than or equal to two, then what I get when I pull back, well, this guy is going to be you know, in this case, well, it can't exceed three because, you know, uh, because of this condition here. So what I'm getting is that this pullback, when I round it down, I just get two E. And so then the multiplier ideal is just the, uh, the push forward of O of minus E. And that is going to be equal to O, the ideal sheaf at that point. So, and then, you know, you can kind of tweak these if you like to say, well, if the, um, you know, if you just had alpha greater than one, then, you know, then uh, the ideal sheaf you're going to get is going to include functions vanishing along the corresponding component. So, and that's exactly the, you know, and, and you know, the condition for a divisor to be KLT along its generic point is just that the coefficient is less than or equal to one. And then if you have, um, you know, divisors crossing, you know, and this is not a normal crossing divisor, but sort of each pair of pieces of it is. And so the condition for that to be uh, log uh, KLT in the middle is the, uh, is just that the total multiplicity is, uh, is less than two. And so that's encoded exactly inside this statement that once uh, once the multiplicity exceeds two, then the multiplier ideal becomes i of the point. Okay, questions so far. Okay, so let's do a more complicated example. I'm going to do the uh, you know kind of the standard example, which is uh, you know if you have a cuspidal curve in P two and then you assign a coefficient to it. So, so let's take P two and then alpha C. Where c is equal is just the vanishing of uh, x squared minus y cubed. Okay, so we have, you know, in this case, we're going to have a cuspidal curve sitting inside our uh, our surface. 
coefficient alpha. And so what we have to do is we first have to take a log resolution of this curve. Um, and so you haven't seen this before. It is a standard example that you know you should, you know, at some point work out on your own. But uh, let's just go through it together right now. So of course, you know, this is a well-behaved thing away from the singular point of the curve. So that's the first thing we do is we blow up that point. And so the uh, so you know, there's multiple things we have to keep track of. Um, so one is just the is going to be the multiplicity of uh, of the curve c along that uh, along that blow up. And the other is going to be we have to collect terms from the uh, uh, canonical divisor. So just for the for the first blow up, let's, let's you know call this x. And then the first blow up is we have x one. All right. And so we have a map like this. And you know what we have is we're going to have that kx one is equal to uh, F1 upper star, or maybe I should call it mu. So mu1 upper star, Kx plus E. That's just because we're just blowing up a single point. So this is mu1. And then what we're going to get is we're going to get, um, you know, our exceptional divisor, which we should call E1. And then the picture that we get is we're going to have the, uh, uh, the strict transform of this curve which I'm going to abuse notation and keep calling it C because uh, I don't really want to have to keep track of a bunch of stuff, but, um, you know, I'll, maybe I'll label it. I'll just have uh, alpha times C. And then, you know, you have to kind of keep track. Yeah, okay, maybe I should just put a one here to distinguish. Uh, and so then, you know, what we have to know is we have to know what is the multiplicity of E along this curve C here. Okay, so, you know, if you've done this calculation before, it almost becomes second nature that the multiplicity is two. Um, but to actually work this out algebraically, we have to use, you know, this blow up construction. And so the idea is that, you know, you can kind of, you can do this most easily by hand by noting that in the blow up construction, well, the picture you have is that you have on uh, functions you have uh, x comma y goes to x prime y comma y or x comma y prime x because the idea is that you're replacing x and y with the, the ratios of slopes of lines to that point but you can't define simultaneously all the slopes so the two charts come in this form and the other form. Okay so this is one of the charts and you know either we got lucky and it contains this point here, or we got unlucky and it doesn't. If we got unlucky, we can just pick the other one. Okay, so um, the idea here is we say, okay, well, how do we figure out what the curve C is doing? Well, we just see what happens to this x squared minus y cubed. So the pullback is just literally, you know, because, because that, that map right there is literally the pullback. So the idea is like, when you're studying schemes, um, you know, you have the whole, rigmarole with the, the topological space that has a sheaf of rings on it, blah, blah, blah. But then the point is that the, the maps are going to be continuous maps along with the pullback map on the functions. Because this is exactly what functions do, is to say, well, if I have a, if I have a map of spaces and I want to know, you know, that not only tells me how to send points on one space onto the other side, but it means that I, if I have a function in the target, then I can evaluate it on the source just by checking points in the source, sending them into the target. So it's exactly that, I mean, I don't even want to say intuition, but just that picture that's going on here. So then if I map that like this, um, then what I have is I have, uh, this, this becomes x prime y squared minus y cubed. So then I factor out a y squared, and then I get y squared times uh, x prime squared minus y. And yes, and then, let's see, so, um, yeah, 
I think this is the correct one. Um, yeah, it's like a parabola and yeah. a double line. Right, right, yeah. So the idea is like here, the variables are x prime and y. And then what we get is exactly, as you say, we have a parabola like this and then a line with multiplicity 2. And so that's telling us that uh, if I take mu1 upper star of the curve C, then that's going to be just C1. That's this one plus 2 times uh, E. Okay, and so that's you know, and that's the picture here, and that justifies the picture that I've drawn on the board. Okay, so, you know, and of course if I put an alpha in front, then I better have an alpha here, and then a 2 alpha e. So these are the two things I have to keep track of. Well, and then it's just, you know, a matter of iterating the, you know, the procedure. So, you know, the next one I'm going to do is I'm going to blow up again to get an x2. Uh, I guess I'm going to draw my, my maps pointing upward. U2, um, right, and so then I have you know, E1, and then I'm trying to separate it away with an E2, but then because these are intersecting like this with one uh, layer of tangency, with one, with, where they're tangent first order, then, you know, the tangents are, you know, the, this is, this uh, well, rather, E2 is supposed to represent all the tangent directions, and then E1 in the, um, and then C2, yeah, I guess, you know, this is not, I guess this should be like E1 prime or something, but, uh, yeah, let's just abuse notation and identify this one and that one. You know, the problem, of course, is that you have to, you know, you have to pull back in the strict transform, and then it's like, depending on your point of view, you know, you might want to keep the same name for the pullback, or you might want to keep it for the strict transform, and sort of the, the safe thing to do is to change the names on both, but it gets kind of uh, annoying and clunky after a while. So um, usually when I'm doing these kind of calculations, I just kind of give up and say, well, uh, we're just going to identify the curve with the strict transform, because like, um, but it's like a dangerous thing to do from the perspective of the divisor theory. Um, and the reason is because now, um, you know, I want to talk about like the pullback of E1, and that's not E1, it's E1 plus E2. Okay, but, you know, so in particular, the way we see this is that I have that kx2 is equal to uh, u2 upper star kx1 plus E2. Okay, but then this one, uh, we know that that's mu1 upper star kx plus e. So this one is a kx plus e. Uh, and so then kx plus e1. So then the whole thing is I get a mu1 2 upper star. You know, that's the, the, uh, um, the concatenation or the composition of those maps. Um, and so this becomes mu1 2 upper star of kx, and then I have an e2 here, I have an e1 here, and then I get an, but and then pulling back that e1, I get an extra e2 here. So then this becomes this plus e1 plus 2 e2. Okay, and then, you know, if I take, likewise, if I pull back c, well, I'm going to get Certainly one copy of C2, um, and then I'm getting, you know, and that I can think of as just the pullback of C1, and then I'm getting a copy of E2 from the fact that C passed through that point, and then I get a copy of E2 for every time E1 passed through the point. So I'm getting, getting an alpha amount from C, and then two alpha from E1. So this is gonna give me alpha C2 plus two alpha E1 plus three alpha E2. Okay. So that is the next blow up. And then we still have to do one more because uh, we have to, uh, you know, we have to get to the point where these things uh, 
uh, are a normal crossing divisor. Okay, and then again, you know, if you if you want to get this picture here, you can do that again by doing a substitution like there. Um, I guess I want. Um, I guess I now want to do the other substitution because, uh, you know, here the x prime has the larger multiplicity. Um, so here, if I send x prime y to uh, x prime. Uh, x prime y prime, then this guy becomes uh, x prime squared y prime squared uh, x prime squared minus x prime y prime, uh, which is then going to equal x prime cubed y prime squared and then x prime minus y prime. Okay, and that's exactly the picture we have here because the coefficients we have in this picture are the curve, the search transfer of the curve, which is this one right here. That one is, uh, has multiple speed one. Um, and then, you know, the previous divisor we blew up, that one has multiple speed two, that's right here. And then the, th the, the second one we blew up is multiple speed three, and so you can read that off here. So the coefficients I have here, here, and here are exactly the exponents I have when I am doing the algebra, which is, you know, which is exactly what it should be because these are, um, you know, this is a local equation for the scheme. Okay, so let's finish the calculation. One more blow up. Okay, then um, well, let's do it over on the other board here. So, um, so U3. And then the third blow up should make everything nice. So then I have an E3, uh, E1, C, E2. Uh, I guess this should be E3, C3. Um, and then again, you know, kx3 is equal to mu3 upper star kx2 plus e3. And then I can just, you know, rewrite that in terms of the, uh, the first one. So then this, this is, uh, well, if I just say mu for the composition of all the maps, then this is mu upper star kx. Um, and then you can say, okay, well, um, then I have to pull back E1 and E2. So that's gonna give me, again, I just see the regular E1 and E2, E1 and 2 E2, but then the amount of E3s I get is that I'm getting this one, plus two from the E2, plus one from the E1, so I get four E3. All right. And then, you know, by the same token, I can just, you know, work out this uh, the pullback of alpha C. Well, it's going to be alpha C3 plus uh, uh, 2 alpha E1 plus 3 alpha E2. And then the last thing is that I get multiplicity from the 1, the 2, and the 3, so I just have... 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6 alpha along E3. Okay, and so now the multiplier ideal computation is pretty straightforward. So the idea is we're subtracting the round down of this. So we just have to care about when the round down hits various thresholds. So in particular, the first threshold it hits is kind of the most important one. That's called the log canonical threshold. And that's when um, the multiplier ideal first appears. So you know, if you start with, you know, if I start with zero C here and I just push 
you know, I'm just pushing forward this thing. Then this divisor, you know, doesn't move at all. So when I take the push forward, I just get, um, you know, the thing I started with, I just get the, uh, the ideal function, like the, the unit ideal function, so I get nothing. And so then we just have to look, okay, if I'm then subtracting off, um, you know, as I let alpha get larger and larger, I'm then uh, subtracting off this stuff. Well, so first off, we just have to, we have to note where uh, the difference, so, if, so what I have here is I have, uh, you know, I have E1 plus 2E2 plus 3E3 minus the round down of alpha times C. Oh, 4E3, oh, yeah. Oh, the th yeah, okay, sorry, I copied the wrong thing. Okay, there we go. That 3 was from E2 on the other one. So this one plus 2 alpha E1 plus 3 alpha E2 plus 4 alpha E3. And, you know, you, so you gotta, you just note the first time alpha makes it so that, um, six alpha E3? Yeah, six. There we go. So the first value of alpha, such that when I take this difference, I get so I get a divisor that's negative because the, the negative divisors are going to correspond to ideals upstairs, and then there'll be ideals downstairs as well. So how does this work? Well, okay. So for C, C gets in trouble where alpha when alpha is one. Okay. So that's how it works for like every every. Uh, divisor is that, uh, you know, you, you have the multiplier ideal is just the ideal sheaf of the divisor if it's a uh, normal crossing divisor with multiplicity 1. All right, then for E1, again, here, well, I need, you know, the, the place where this one gets in trouble is one more than the coefficient here, so that's when 2 alpha is just 2, that's again when alpha is 1. All right, so, you know, we'll assume alpha is less than one. Same thing for E2, is that when three alpha E2 is one, that, uh, sorry, when alpha is one, then three alpha E2 is just three E2, and then the different, and then I get something negative in the difference. But what I'm really looking for is the last coefficient, because it's not when alpha equals one that something happens, but when it's when it, 6 alpha equals 5. So the log canonical threshold is alpha equals 5 sixth. Okay. And then at the threshold, so if I take j of x uh, 5 6 c, this is going to equal just the ideal of the point. Okay, and Let's see, so what's the right way to do this? I always have a little bit of trouble thinking about uh, the push forward. Because like, what does the push forward mean? Well, it just means that instead of thinking about, um, yeah, so the idea, is, the idea is that I have upstairs, uh, you know, the ideal of, uh, of things vanishing along E3. Like once I hit five six, then then the thing I'm pushing forward is e three, and then okay. So then what do I want? Well, then I want um, you know if I'm viewing that as an ideal sheaf, I'm kind of, I'm taking the sub sheaf. I mean, yeah, I guess it is really the sub sheaf of uh, the functions downstairs, which uh, which vanish along here. And so the idea is if I have a function downstairs, then uh, all it needs to do to vanish along here 
is it just has to vanish along the point. Because you say, okay, well, um, if it vanishes at the point, then it has multiple seat E1, and then so it certainly has multiple seat E3. So, you know, that's the idea of how to compute these push forwards, is that, you know, it, it's not really anything scary, it's just saying, okay, which functions downstairs, when you pull them back, have vanish to the right orders? So, you know, I mean, we didn't really talk about infinitely near points, but uh, that was kind of a classical sort of construction to talk about, you know, if you do an iter it's like, uh, when I'm doing this iterated blow up, the idea is that, you know, here, like classically, they would have thought of this construction as I'm blowing up, uh, you know, three points that are sort of infinitely close together, or, you know, maybe in more modern language, kind of along some jet or something. Um, and, you know, this kind of more, at least to me, more precise language of, you know, here's the log resolution, and then, uh, you know, we did this, these specific blow-ups or whatever. It allows us to say, well, the multiplier ideal downstairs is just, you know, it's just the functions that when you pull them back, they satisfy certain vanishing conditions upstairs. So here the vanishing condition is just, I vanish along E3, and then you can, and then you can straightforwardly check, well, the condition to do that is just that I vanish at the point. Okay. Questions about this example? So I suppose it's worth asking, okay, well then what happens when alpha equals one? So you can, you can easily convince yourself that nothing happens between five sixths and one, because as I increase alpha, then it's only when alpha equals one that anything shows up along C, E1, E2, um, and then E3, you know, that's the next step for that one. So when I'm, uh, when I'm at one, then, um, then the, the vanishing that I have to have is that I have, uh, I have to vanish to order one at C3, order two along E3, and then orders one along E1 and E2. And then the same kind of argument says that, okay, well, I know I have to vanish to order one around C, along C3. So that tells me that I get, uh, I have to be divisible by this function x squared minus y cubed. Um, but then I'm done because that vanishes to higher order at each of these places. So that's enough to say that, oh, hey, the multiplier ideal of x and c is just uh, the ideal of c itself. Okay, so. You know, and then if C were like a more, you know, a very singular curve, it might be that the, um, you know, it's, well, don't quote me on this because I can't think of an example off the top of my head. I'd have to think about it, but it's at least kind of, I think it's like plausible that, uh, you know, this ideal could be kind of nastier at the singular point. Um, let's see, I mean, yeah, that's probably true. That's that's a sort of inversion of a junction type statement, I think. So, um, you know, if if I have like a really knotted up singular curve, then I think it's quite quite plausible this could be. Although I can't think of an example off the top of my head. Okay, so that's you know our first uh, calculation of multiplier ideals. Um, so I have about ten minutes left. Um, so I'm not going to get to the. Um, yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a nice formula for uh, multiplier ideals in the kind of monomial case, um, but I won't really do that today. Um, what I think I want to talk about is, so first off, so what's the point of, of uh, talking about these? Well, um, it gives you a lot of nice stuff. Um, you, know, the, you know, the main thing is that we get another vanishing theorem. And this is kind of, you know, maybe, it is the ultimate form of the Halmano Vueg vanishing theorem, is the Halmano Vueg natal vanishing theorem, which generally this form of the theorem is not the one that I see in, like, you know, used to prove MMP theorems, but um, it's very helpful for doing things like showing that a particular linear series that you know comes from an ample divisor is actually very ample, that it actually has 
whatever point separation properties you want. So this theorem is the uh, Alamada Dweg Natal Vanishing Theorem. And the idea is we say, well, let's let x delta uh, be a pair. Um, and, you know, I want some singularity assumptions on x, but probably not too crazy ones. Um, you know, I mean, we could, we could, we could assume something like, uh, that x itself is smooth and all the singularities are in the delta, the direct has terminal singularities of some sort. Um, and maybe I think, uh, I think even x can be quite singular as long as it has to be like normal or something. And, you know, you, and then you have to worry about like some Q Gorenstein type assumptions. But, uh, um, you know, so there's some smoothness assumptions on this, but pretty weak ones. Um, and then, you know, A ample. And then the idea is that if we take Hi of x, uh, j of x delta uh, tensored with uh, O of uh, kx plus A plus delta, then this guy vanishes. Okay, so when delta is KLT, this multiplier ideal is just O, and so you get the regular column on Buick vanishing. But <clears throat> the idea here is to say, okay, you know, so where would this show up? Well, I would say, you know, you'd have, uh, you know, some locus Z, which is uh, where the, the ideal vanishes, so you'd have something like OZ of KX plus, uh, a plus delta, and then if I have H0 here, then this gives me a surjection from H0 of Kx plus A plus delta on the big thing. So, you know, so the utility of this is that if like Z is, say, a point, then, well, you can just lift sections then. So it makes kind of an interesting kind of, uh, you know, uh, push and pull kind of argument because, like, the idea is you want to show some, um, you know, you'll want to show some properties of this divisor, like it has a lot of sections, and you know, when a divisor has a lot of sections, that sort of means oh, you can move them around. You know, morally, it's like the divisor is ample or very ample. Um, but then the way that we prove it is we say oh, well, I want to hook up this divisor so that delta can be very singular. So it's like I'm adding a very bad divisor so that, uh, you know, so that the z is like the singular locus. So the idea is saying, okay, well, I can lift, you know, wherever the bad singular locus is, I can lift the section up to the global variety. Okay, so I'll say a little bit more uh, about how you use arguments like this on Monday. Um, so the other thing that I should mention is that, um, you know, this theory of multiplier ideals was very exciting when it was discovered because it came from, like, it not only showed up in birational geometry, but it was, um, you know, it was, uh, so Nadal himself was in, uh, you know, he was working in complex analysis. And the idea was that there's an alternate analytic definition of these, uh, multiplier ideals, which is, which is that instead of our divisor, we have some function phi, which is, you know, plurie subharmonic. Well, the idea is that if this is like of alpha times some divisor, the idea is if I take a function, so this should really be like, you know, so really what I'm thinking of is this is log of our f. Well, it should be f to the alpha, but then I can just put the alpha in front. So, you know, and then, um, you know, here I'm taking 
you know, the real branch, the larger the, uh, well, you know, I mean, when it's, when it's the, uh, you're taking the absolute value here, it's not a problem because this is um, just a real value function then. And the idea, the idea is we look at the ideal of functions f such that if I take the integral of the absolute value of, uh, okay, well maybe let's use g, so I'm using f up there. So functions g such that the integral of the absolute value of g squared times e to the minus 2 phi converges. Okay, and then this is just the multiplier ideal. Where d is the vanishing of f with coefficient alpha. So, you know, people were studying these for independent reasons of birational geometry, but then it turns out, oh, it's the same thing. So, that might seem a little strange, but the point is that. Um, you know, you're trying to decide whether this integral converges, and it's easy to determine whether this inter. Uh, so these these functions, I guess, should be holomorphic. But you know, this the nice thing is that this you know it doesn't have to do with algebraic geometry itself. It's just the algebraic geometry comes in because you're looking at holomorphic functions. Okay, and so like, why does this give you the same thing? Well. The proof in Lazarsfeld is to say they transform in the same ways. And so why is that? Well, the idea is that... Uh, professor, wrong question. Yeah. D is the vanishing locus of F. Right. Uh, oh yeah, there should be an alpha here. Yeah, so... Yeah, so if D... Yeah, so if D is the vanishing of F, and alpha is the coefficient. So, uh, yeah, so it turns out that you know, this is, you know, you know, if everything is normal crossings, then it's, you know, exactly what you think it is. Um, because, you know, the idea is that you just want to make sure if everything was normal crossings, then, you know, you do this, you just get, like, f back. But, you know, you get, like, f to the minus 2 here, g squared here. So the idea is that g has to be, like, as big as f when the normal crossing case. So that's what it is on a log resolution. But then why do you have to have the adjunction formula in there? Well, that's just the Jacobian because you know when you when you change coordinates in an integral, you have to have a factor of the Jacobian. That factor of the Jacobian is the adjunction formula. So, and that's just to say, you know, when I'm integrating, I'm integrating with respect to a volume element. And that volume element is some multiple of the canonical divisor. So when you talk about integrals, you're sort of secretly talking about uh, measuring the canonical divisor locally. And so uh, this is just you know, saying, oh, what do I have to multiply by to make sure that the log canonical divisor doesn't have any poles when I change coordinates to a different chart where I can actually do the computation. OK, so next time I want to uh, let's see, there's a, uh, there's a theorem in Lazarsfeld that I forget who it's due to, but uh, gives a nice combinatorial description in the case where, um, <clears throat> well, you can, you know, there's a variant of this where instead of D, you take, you use an ideal, and it's like D is like the generic member of the ideal. Um, <clears throat> but then you can say, well, what are the multiplier ideals for like monomial ideals? And then, there's a nice combinatorial description of that. Um, and then I also think I want to try and give you an example where you can use this kind of argument to prove a nice theorem. So that'll be for Monday. <laughs>